Peace Student Data Corps Data Science Career Panel. We will be starting at exactly 3 p.m. Um, in the meantime, please feel free to enter questions that you may have for the panel in the Q&A area. And we also encourage you to join the Slack community. Um, the link is in the chat area. Excellent, we are recording. And now we would like to begin, Saru. Good afternoon and welcome to the Northeast Student Data Corps Data Science Career Panel. Today's webinar is the second in a series highlighting the wide range of educational opportunities and career paths available in data science and data analytics. We are featuring experts from academia, government, industry, and nonprofits who will share their knowledge about and the experience in data science with the community. I am Faru Garamani, Associate Vice President for Research, Innovation, and Sponsored Programs at NJ Edge. NJ Edge is a regional research and education network located in New Jersey. I am delighted to be a founding member of the Northeast Student Data Corps and a co-lead for the Northeast Student Data Corps outreach team, along with Jennifer Oxenfort, who is the Director of Member Services and New York City um, Dark Fiber at NYSERNET. I will be co-moderating today, um, today's panel along with Haley Stewart, who is a junior at Columbia University, a student assistant at the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub, and a project coordinator of the Northeast Student Data Corps. And before reviewing the agenda, I would like to provide a special welcome to our distinguished panelists, Sanja Reddy Hesnuri, Jason Williams, Patricia Ordinez, and Martin Pavlovsky, who will be introduced more formally in a few minutes. Next slide, please. Today's agenda will begin with an overview of the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub and the Northeast Student Data Corps, followed by the panel discussion. During the panel discussion, we will engage the panel with a set of questions which have been mined and curated based on your input during the registration process. And if time is available at the end of the panel, we will address additional time, additional questions. Um, the formal part of the program will end at 4 p.m. However, there will be additional time um, between 4 p.m. and 4.15 for additional questions. Uh, following the panel, announcements will be provided about some of the exciting new Northeast Student Data Corps initiatives. And as I mentioned, the formal part of the program will end at 4 p.m. Um, please note the event is being recorded and we encourage you to join the Slack community and engage with us um, throughout the program as well as afterwards. It is now my pleasure to invite Haley Stewart to start the official part of the program. Next slide, please. Thank you, Faru. And again, welcome everyone to the second event of our Data Science Career Panel Series. Um, like Farooq said, I'm Haley. I'm an undergrad junior at Columbia University studying psychology and public health. I'm student assistant at the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub, project coordinator for the Northeast Student Data Corps, and as Farooq mentioned, co-moderator for this panel. So thanks everyone for joining today. We have roughly 400 registrants interested in this event, so we're super excited to have this panel for you all to learn more about data science from our amazing panelists we have today. So the Northeast Student Data Corps is brought to you all by the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub. 
the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub is a community convener and a collaboration hub. We create and enable a network designed to fuel data science innovation through diverse and inclusive community partnerships with academia, higher ed, K through 12, STEM programs, industry, nonprofit, and really anybody who wants to be a part of a network of people in data science. And these partnerships allow us to connect with students, communities, and institutions across the United States and around the world. In fact, we'd like to acknowledge and thank those from all around the world who are tuned in today. Um, a really essential part of the mission of the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub is to increase and expand data science capacity and talent across different areas of focus. So as you can see, we have four main focus areas. The first is education and data literacy. And under this focus area, the Northeastern Data Corps is our premier program and the one you'll be learning about today. So you've all come to the main event. Um, and then under health, we have the COVID Information Commons, which provides a portal to a thousand NSF funded COVID research grants and a community of collaboration and support. In fact, the NIH is joining that community as well. And then there's the urban and rural communities where we have our working group. And finally, there's a responsible data science, including security, privacy, and ethics. So one of our cool programs under this area is the Connected Healthcare Cybersecurity Workshop Series. And we actually have a workshop coming up on April 28th that will be co-sponsored with IEEE. So you can access more information on each of these focus areas and the hub um, and the corresponding activities on our website at nebigdatahub.org slash about. Next slide, please. So on this slide, uh, we wanna to talk to you more about the Northeastern Data Corps, which is why you're all here. Um, so the NSDC was created as a community developed initiative. We really wanted to foster a, a diverse data science community that started with the students of data science. And so last year we did a call for participation and we had over 20 people interested in creating the foundation of the NSDC. And that included researchers, professors, folks from industry, um, nonprofits, undergrad and grad students. And they happen to make up the founding committee. So all the awesome faces you see on the screen right now, um, the people who really helped build this program from the ground up. And we organize the work done through the NSCC through three different teams. So there's content pedagogy that helps to build a curriculum leveraging academia and industry generated resources and materials to teach data science fundamentals. And from their great work, we now have the Learner Central and Educator Central, which we will mention more about later on. Uh, next, we have the Pair Instructor and Mentoring Team helping to teach data science remotely to students who don't have access to data science programs and who play a significant role in shaping the student experience. So this team is uh, starting their work through the Slack channel that we've launched. So you can access the Slack channel to connect with others, request mentoring, and we'll be continuing to evolve that program as the Slack channel grows. We'll also provide um, a URL for the Slack channel later on. Um, and then finally, we have outreach. So outreach is uh, responsible for all of our outreach initiatives including this career panel series um, and our Career Central webpage that has resources to help with career development. And we'll talk more about that as well later on. So overall, the NSDC is really the breath of our community. Um, and we like to thank the team for their leadership and great work. And you can find more information here at anybigdatahub.org slash NSDC. Move on to the next slide. Great. So for today, we're delighted to have our four panelists here join us. Here we have Sanjana Reddy Posnery, a data scientist on the Expert Labs learning team and artificial intelligence curriculum developer at IBM. Next, we have Jason Williams, the associate director and external collaborations lead at the Cold Spring Harbor Lab DNA Learning Center. And there's Patricia Ordonez, professor in the computer science department at the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras. And we have Martin Pavlovsky, a PhD student at the Center for Data Analytics and Biomedical Informatics at Temple University. So Avishak, uh, feel free to stop sharing your screen now as we transition into our discussion with the panelists. Hi, everyone. Um, so let's start you all off uh, with giving um, each of you giving a more in-depth introduction of yourselves. So 
Uh, please share with us your personal journeys with data science. When did you realize you liked data science? Um, what specific experiences drew you to the field? Um, what drew you to the job you applied for now? How, how exactly did you get involved in this field? Um, so let's start this off with Sanjana. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Sanjana and I'm a data scientist at IBM. Um, so to give you all an overview about my journey in data science, uh, I'd like to start off with my background. So I did my undergraduation in mechanical engineering from a university in India. As you all know, mechanical engineering has nothing to do with data science, but my next step after undergraduation was to become an entrepreneur and start a business. And then I started doing a little bit of research about, you know, how do you go about starting a business? What is the most essential thing to begin a business? And then in that process, I came across this interesting quote by John Owen, and that states that information is what you need to do business. At that point of time, I did not understand the significance of that line. So I started doing more research about it. And then I came to know that every business is built on information, be it a social media business, be it a food business, be it technology, whatever it is, it's built on information. So I changed my plans and I thought of pursuing masters from Carnegie Mellon University in information systems management. Given my background in mechanical engineering, I wasn't sure I will get ac accepted into the university, but fortunately universities just don't judge you by the background or knowledge you have. They judge you by the passion you have towards the degree that you want to pursue. So I got into CMU and then on, I got an opportunity to pursue internships with various firms like Adobe and Ernst & Young. And through all these experiences with my master's degree and the internships, I realized that firms do have tons of data, but what they struggle with is transforming this data into information. And that is what they need data scientists for. And that's when I realized the significance of a data scientist for a business. And that's when I decided that I want to become one and oriented all my energy towards becoming one. And therefore here I am uh, today working at IBM as a data scientist and focusing on AI curriculum development. So that's it. Uh, that, that was like a brief overview of my journey as a data scientist. Thank you so much, Sanjana, for sharing more about that. And I think it's really important to highlight, as you said, um, that there doesn't necessarily have to be a conventional path to data science. It's really however your path is, that's the right one. So thank you for that. Uh, Jason, would you like to go on and answer? Sure, thank you, Haley, and thank you to everybody uh, for the wonderful in invitation and for everybody who is uh, uh, listening. I, I don't know if I could narrate as well as Sanjay uh, Shandana did uh, my uh, journey into data science. Um, maybe I could start, maybe it started when I was young in a sense uh, that I am, uh, if you've ever heard of the term, the Oregon Trail generation. So you can tell if you're in this generation or not, if you played Oregon Trail video game in school. So I was at the generation of which, you know, there had never been a computer in the household before. Uh, and so I had access to the computer. And on a monthly basis, I would probably um, mess it up and need to actually reformat it um, and completely reinstall everything because I was just playing around. Uh, as uh, you saw on the slides there, I'm at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Uh, I am at the DNA Learning Center and I'm a biologist, so uh, nothing in my title suggests, uh, just as we heard, uh, the term data science, um, but I always had some interest in computers and software and data. And um, as an undergraduate, when I was uh, working at uh, Stony Brook University further on the island, uh, a lot of our work was computational, not just uh, in, in the case that we were doing, we were studying uh, the phylogeny or the ordering of, of different species of yams across the globe where people would send us uh, leaves and we would extract DNA, but ultimately you would take that DNA sequence data and do different types of uh, computational analyses to it. 
Uh, and then later on, when I came here to Cold Spring Harbor, I was working at the bench doing all sorts of genetics experiments. Um, but ultimately, I found my way to the learning center where I teach. And actually, as we just heard, uh, I have a very similar uh, position to uh, Sanjana in that I develop curriculum and help to train others. Um, I started working on a project called Cyverse, which is an infrastructure project funded by the National Science Foundation. It wasn't called that when we began. It's called iPlant. Uh, and we developed tools for plant biologists. And over the years, I've, I've traveled to hundreds of different institutions helping biologists who were also uh, more at the bench or at the field uh, transition or be able to use bioinformatics tools in their research and apply data science uh, to what they were doing. So, um, you know, this is not, not in any way planned, not in any way uh, intentional, um, but it, it's the reality, as we also just heard, that data is a part of everything that we do, and as scientists, it's a part of everything that we do. Um, so, combined, m combining my own intrinsic interests with uh, data and software, uh, that's what sort of led me to this position. And I think increasingly, we are seeing scientists um, in different uh, domains, um, and not just scientists, journalists, everyone, right? Uh, starting to think about data and how it relates to their work. And if you can do both, whatever um, those two passions of yours might be, uh, combining it with data is really, really an excellent uh, opportunity and tool to go somewhere you might not have thought you've gone. So that's a little bit of my journey. Thank you, Jason. That's super exciting and just really influential in how you've helped to kind of expand data science um, and leverage it in your own domain of science and beyond. So thank you for that. Uh, Patricia, uh, feel free to introduce yourself and tell us more about what you do and how it relates to data science. I think you're muted. So I'm a professor at the University of Puerto Rico in computer science. Um, so I really started in computer science and I actually started right out of um, high school. Actually in high school, I took my first programming class. And this was back with, if I had to date myself, I was Atari Pong video game and uh, Galaga. So I know <laughs> you probably don't know about these. But anyway, the whole point is that this was way before, like it was at the beginning of HTML. So if you can think of how much um, we've come, we've come really far. But anyway, so the point is at that point, I was so intimidated. I went to my first mini computers class. I was so intimidated that I dropped it. And I'm not going to tell you the long story, but I started, um, I'm going to jump around. I became a high school teacher. And then from the high school teacher, I started to realize, wow, like there are these guys who were taking these classes and everybody said, oh, they can program. How smart are they? And I was teaching the math and I realized, they're not that smart. <laughs> not that they're not smart. They're just, it was just exaggerated that if you could program, you were like this genius. And I was like, they're struggling in my class. I don't understand why everybody is saying all this. So it made me actually, um, and then other students started talking about the internet and talking about how great it was. And they got me kind of hooked on, hey, maybe I should check it out again. And so what I did was, um, I, I couldn't afford to go back to school, so I tried to take a, a tech job. I love teaching to get, be tech. I was um, tech support, and that was an awful experience also because just the culture was not so good. So like in, like in the year 2000, I, I left. I was about to leave tech. I decided I was, you know, I'm going to travel through Latin America, figure out what I want to do. And everywhere I went in Latin America, no matter how remote, I could find an internet cafe. And I was like, oh my God, this is going to be big. And um, and I told them, you know, I really need to, I really need to go back. And so I finally found a company that um, needed teaching. And so they basically taught programming. And I said, well, I'll be your, I'll be your coordinator if you let let me teach me, pay for my education, and I learn to um, to code and can become a teacher of of programming languages. So I, it's basically like if you can think of um, a learning school. Uh, like the, the the one week boot camps, all that. That's what I was doing back in 2005, 2000. Uh, yeah, up until about no 2000 to 2005. And then I learned to program all these languages, and I decided I'm going to start going to school at night. And I found the same intimidating atmosphere. And I thought to myself, 
this has got to change because I program more than all my, fac my the faculty and I'm barely making it because there's so much stuff that's missing here. So I was like determined to become a faculty. And that's a long story about how that all um, almost didn't happen. Um, just because I think we're way too hard on students in grad school. So those of you who are in grad school, stick with it. I know that um, it's, it's, it's unfairly hard. Um, it needs to be nicer in science, <laughs> more supportive. Um, and so I've become a big advocate about that since then. And so I finally, um, my research though, what brought me back to school that made me wanna think I wanted to do research was basically that I was seeing the advances in health. And I had wanted my, you know, my parents wanted me to be a doctor. My whole family is doctor. And so I was like, okay, this is a way I could do medicine and computation. I couldn't stand the um, blood. So I was like, uh, so let me do like informatics. And so that made me go back to do a CS degree. And uh, I didn't think I was going to do the PhD, but I got the PhD done. And then I got, went on to being a faculty and I thought, okay, this will be two years. And then I like, to... <laughs> and now it's been like nine years that I've been a faculty. I'm an associate professor now. So data science, when I did computer science, nobody was doing data science. And it was a really big battle to prove to everybody that I had to use uh, computer science to do, do data science. And that this was like, a big field. And so it's really funny. That's part of the problem that I had with graduating because it wasn't a field. And um, and so it's funny now that same department has a data science program. <laughs> so, and so I'm actually now building a data science program um, in at the University of Puerto Rico. And so one of the things that I think I should tell people is just like, sometimes you have visions that people can't see. And so because they can't see it, they tell you you're not capable, but that's not the case. <laughs> so there, I had my timer done. <laughs> wow, thanks so much, Patricia, for sharing that. And yes. I think a lot of people can relate to your beginnings and first exposure to data science, because it can seem pretty intimidating from the outside. But I think one of the main takeaways is that, you know, you tried it, you made it your own, even when it was in its like first emerging stages. Um, and now you're owning your own data science journeys, um, like a lot of other people can. So thank you. And finally, Martin, um, please tell us more about your personal experience and journey with data science. Thank you, Kaylee. And thank you everyone for inviting me to, to this panel. I'm really delighted to be, to be a part of this event. Uh, so my journey with data science, I would say like in more general terms, my journey with, with computer science starts, I think sometime in late high school, maybe I was third or fourth year in my in high school, I started uh, being to be interested in, in programming in, in general, I started learning some programming languages on my own. Uh, but nobody kind of guided me this was kind of like something that I enjoyed doing like in my when when taking some time off and um by the time I finished high school, I realized that okay, I can I can actually uh, do like uh, like uh, I like try to pursue a bachelor's degree in this. So I uh, enrolled uh, in the Faculty of Computer Science uh, and Engineering in in Macedonia, in my home country. Um, I did my undergraduate studies there, but it was not until my third year of studies where uh, so essentially my the whole studies were oriented more towards electrical engineering i would say so i do have like a electrical engineering background but towards my third year in my undergraduate studies i was allowed to take more elective courses so one of these elective courses was, was machine learning i took machine learning i didn't have any expectations at that at that time but i was kind of amazed by 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 the course um and and I, moreover by the professor i had a really terrific I, I was fortunate really fortunate to have a terrific professor for for this course and i was kind of uh, impressed by the material it was uh it was like nothing i have ever like like no other course i have ever taken like before that so i kind of like my interest uh, the, um, kind of drastically shifted towards towards machine learning and i continue taking related courses such as data mining pattern recognition computer vision and so on uh, and by the time i finished my undergraduate studies i was all i was all i have already decided that i would like to pursue like maybe a career like uh, either academic or industrial in in this direction. So at that time, um, I um, uh, 
I, I was kind of like on a, I needed to make like a pivotal decision whether to kind of uh, go for a master de master's degree and continue that kind of uh, uh, education educational path or maybe to take a year or two off and solely do research. Uh, and in that, and, and by doing so to prepare for maybe directly enrolling in a PhD program. So I chose the latter. Uh, I don't know if it was a, a wise choice at this point, but at that time it felt like, like the right thing to do. So I was essentially a part, like I joined a center, like uh, I didn't go for my master's degree, but I joined like a center or, or I would say a lab uh, at the National Academy in my home country, where I was able to do like, uh, to only do research with no pressure. For, uh, for for over the course of a year and a half or two years, I would say. So this kind of gave me, I would say, the, the fundamental research uh, skill set that I needed to pursue a PhD afterwards. So kind of, at that point, things started uh, kind of happening for me, and I was fortunate enough to to attend a conference like in in the like in southeastern Europe near my home country. But at that conference, my current advisor was 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 also one of the the main keynote speakers he was kind of like we started uh, uh, he, he was he was interested in my work and i was interested in what he's doing in, in his lab so at that time he invited me to to join first as a vision, visiting scholar at temple university in philadelphia uh, and uh, right after my visiting scholar program i directly enrolled uh, like uh, in the phd program here at temple university and if it, and since then, I have been like a PhD student for, I would say, three and a half years now. So I think that would be kind of like a, some sort of a summary uh, of my, my, my kind of like my journey with, with uh, computer science and maybe data science and machine learning in particular. Mm -hmm. Wow, your journey is definitely really inspiring. And thank you for sharing more about that. Um, especially, you know, you didn't have previous experience with machine learning, but you took a stab at it and that kind of started um, what got you interested in the field. And then after that, everything aligned. So that's really amazing. So great. Thank you all for sharing more information on, you know, your roles um, and journeys with data science. Uh, as someone who's just at the beginning of her data science journey, um, I really appreciated learning about the different routes that you each took with it. Um, and I'm sure so many others tuned in today feel the same way. So thank you for that. So our next question um, is in regards to data science for good. Uh, so it's really important that, you know, we try and connect data science to um, society and how it can be used in a way that kind of cultivates a, a better society. Um, so how is data science helping people um, in your own kind of specialties and how can you apply data science to other realms of study and expertise? Um, so let's start this question off with Jason. Uh, we'd love to hear more about how your occupation as a biologist kind of intersects with data science to complete a bigger impact. Thank you uh, again for that question, Haley. Um, I think the last year uh, with the pandemic, oh, you know, uh, we're hoping that we can not talk about it as so much, but it's still a reality of life, but it's an excellent example of actually the application of data science. Um, and, and the use of data science. And in fact, um, really, uh, it's, it's hard to imagine things coming together so quickly where we're at the point of having a vaccine uh, if this had happened uh, even you know, 10 years ago uh, or 15 years ago in the sense that data has been such a big part of how we have been able um, to come up with solutions and be able to understand what's going on. Um, there are many different ways that I could argue or, or make my point about that. Um, but the one that occurs to me first is to actually uh, talk about the idea of data literacy and the idea of open science and open data. Because uh, what we see at um, the level or in, in my field, in my discipline, yes, there are people who are a little bit more skilled in terms of their uh, use and understanding of data science, but very broadly, Everybody, whether they have um, particular data science skills or not, um, is aware that we need to be able to share data in order for it to have value and understand what the sharing of that data means. So for those people, depending on where you've looked and where you've read, um, we might be reluctant to call a Microsoft Word document data science, which is fine, uh, but uh, really within uh, the, the first moments of the, the uh, 
SARS virus genome being sequenced in China, it was put in a Word document uh, and it was sent to people who were able to start it right away in thinking about the vaccine. Uh, as a bioinformatician, there would have been some, a little bit more care uh, applied to how I would handle that data. But the point is, is that everybody in the community realized that having that data accessible and having it open uh, was really important. And so I would argue at the, at the outermost layer of you know, data science expertise at the center, just awareness of data is at the edge. Um, one important role of data science for good um, has been the push to make things open and the push to make things accessible, uh, which in turn led to sort of people understanding uh, natively that, oh yeah, I need to be able to share this and other people need to be able to work on this. And at the same time, um, sort of the field of biology was divided into people who could actively work on the, on the um, biological problems, uh, so working in the lab, but also those people who may not have been able to work at, in the, the lab, oftentimes because the lab was shut down, but from home, they were able to work on the data. And so immediately what you saw at um, NIH were information portals going up for biologists saying, okay, here's the latest release of this sequence. Here's the latest uh, release of these tools so that lots of people could start working on problems and people who didn't have that expertise could combine with people who did have that expertise. And also um, that idea of openness is, is very much now in publication. So um, we here at Cold Spring Harbor have something called um, the BioArchive, which is a preprint server, which uh, allows uh, scientists to publish their data and results before they've been peer reviewed. And it got a lot of pushback at the beginning um, because you know people thought that's not traditional, even though, uh, yes, physicists have been doing it for, for a long time, but actually the first preprint servers were biologists at NIH, even decades earlier, although it just never took on. But here it was thousands of papers that were um, uh, immediately published and giving people the, the, the ability to work quickly and relate in relation to whatever the latest results and findings were. So I'd argue a really large percent of that was enabled by open data. And then also, um, I'm gonna stop talking in a minute, but there's just so many stories. Uh, if you think about it, uh, the response to the United States government was not as coordinated as people might have wanted. And, but the fact that the data were available meant that data scientists all over the country could probe and look at what was available because certain states were releasing certain things or even certain municipalities and towns were releasing data and others might not have been. And so savvy data scientists were able to put together clues and make important available data available to people who are making health and policy decisions, even in some cases when the CDC was not in a position to make those data available. So again, that shows the power of openness in the open science and open data movement. Um, the final thing that I'll say about it is that, of course, the story is not all good, right? Um, because there are also uh, stories, I don't think that they were really substantial, but of people who were data scientists and who were commenting on things that really they didn't have the domain expertise to comment on. And so they may have reached erroneous conclusions uh, because they didn't understand the underlying data, even though they were quite capable to make figures and analyses and graphs and, 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 and things like that. So it's a double-edged sword, um, and it does speak to the value of um, always ensuring that the that you know if you want to talk about data science for good, I think it, it can never be good alone. It has to come with thoughtfulness and collaboration in order for you to really achieve that maximum good. Uh, so that's a message to everybody uh, to not go it alone uh, in in the world of data science. Even if somebody's asking you to really to seek out. Uh, other points of view, other expertise, so that you really uh, have understandings and perspectives on the data uh, in a way that can really allow you to do the best work with it. Thank you, Jason. It's it's really great that you brought up you know the push to make things open and accessible in data, and it's interesting to hear the things that you've already worked on to kind of move away from the gatekeeping of data science and. Um, it's really interesting that, you know, COVID has in a way been like a catalyst for more transparency, um, which is really important in the growth and expansion of this field. Um, Patricia, would you like to tell us more about your experience and how it relates to data science for good?
Yes, I, I just want to echo what um, uh, Jason mentioned because um, I'll tell you a story about not having access and how data science can actually, uh, to data, um, and how it actually affected Puerto Rico um, because we had data scientists off the island that could get a group of people uh, together to work together um, and, and come up with a mortality rate. Um, so after hurricane uh, or the death, a death, an estimated death toll is what it is, using mortality rates. Um, and so basically what happened during Hurricane Maria, I don't know if you heard, but the numbers of number of deaths, everyone on the island basically knew that there was no way given the, the impact that the, those numbers were, were possible. Um, and so uh, the data was not made public. And so what data science was able to do was it was um, basically scientists started uh, realizing, hey, what can we do now to try and fix this? And this is where we talk about the, the need for collaboration. It was actually a, um, a psychologist, a woman, uh, Carolyn Buckley, who started like worrying about what was happening in Puerto Rico because the death toll wasn't great. Um, she's a, she's a psycholo uh, social psychologist at, um, in Harvard. And she basically she started contacting and realizing something was off. So she went to then Rafael Rizarri at Harvard, who is a biostatistician, and said, hey, we need to do something about this. And so they got together a big team that required, first of all, some design thinking to figure out how in the world are we going to get this data because nobody is giving it to us. And, um, and then they basically did a survey throughout uh, Puerto Rico to try and like through these health surveys. So they had to basically collaborate with psychologists that were on the field trying to figure out the health of everyone. Um, what is an estimated an estimate the death toll and they had to do statistics to, to calculate that. And they had to look at the rate of change to figure that out. And they had to compare it to previous years to basically prove that the, the estimated death toll <laughs> um, based on these surveys was way higher than what was being reported, like thousand times higher, like 3000, actually the number was 4,645. And I remember that number because after Hurricane Maria, maybe a lot of you don't realize this, but there, was a, there were huge protests about um, against the, the governor uh, as a result of this, uh, this, this um, the, the inaccuracy with the numbers and they actually, it forced the governor to release the data and, and then it also forced, uh, it also forced the, 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 the idea of, um, okay, now they have to do a survey. <laughs> so they had to actually give the data, but they only gave it to a certain team. So they still went ahead and did the calculation. Um, and then once the data was made public, they could come up with a better uh, number. But that number of 4,000, it, it was really like 3,000, which was actually what the, the both teams came up with eventually, but that they came closer than what the government was saying, which they were saying 55 at that time. I mean, that just, just huge. And so I think it's, it's, it's data science for good in that sense. Um, at the end, uh, that number uh, sparked, you know, so many people, angered so many people that when a chat came out about the governor, uh, where it showed that he knew and he was kind of like mocking mortality that, you know, cadavers, is, you know, on the stacking up in the morgue. And he was overthrown, <laughs> not overthrown. He was forced to resign. It's not overthrown. He was forced to, to resign because people were so upset. Um, and it was like two weeks of protests. So it's, it, it just shows you the importance of having open data. Um, and then the power of data science and the power of collaboration um, to, to be able to do that. So that was people off the island that were collaborating with people on the island, um, completely you know, different disciplines coming together uh, to do that publication. And, and they also had it peer reviewed so that it would have validity. And so then it, it just shows you a lot of the, the importance of the entire process and, and, and every step of the of data science uh, there. And then, it's, I mean, it's data science for good because at the end, it, it, it's making data more accessible and it's, it's, a, it's forcing uh, governments to, to, to do that, to, to share the data. Um, and so I think that's, that's a great step. 
Wow. What really resonates with me with that is, and I'm sure others, is just like how essential access is in bridging data science with society, especially at times of catastrophes. Um, so thank you for sharing more about, about that experience. Um, and now I'd like to pass it off to my co-moderator, Faru, who will ask the panelists um, questions regarding career development. Yeah. Thank you, Haley. Um, based on the information that's been shared by all the panelists, it's, it's fascinating how um, you can have various career paths and then also end up in doing different things uh, related to data science. A question that comes to mind um, is, you know, if you could provide from your perspective some existing job opportunities, um, as well as um, your perspectives for the future of data science jobs, and highlight trends in um, data science that students should be aware of, uh, including some top key emerging research areas. Um, Sanja, if you could st uh, start, and then um, Martin, please provide some comments as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Farooq. But uh, definitely, I would like to share uh, how my journey has been in finding internships and my full-time job as a data scientist. So traditionally, you know that we go on a website, search for a job, and then send them a resume, and then wait eagerly for them to contact us. But uh, in my route, I have taken some unconventional routes. And uh, first, let me start off with how I got my internships. So during the course of my master's, I did my internships with Adobe and Ernst & Young. So let me give you a story on how I actually landed uh, in those internships. Um, coming from a mechanical engineering background, I did not have anything related to data science on my resume. So before I graduated, my before I graduate, my motive was to get some experience of data science on my resume so that I can be prepared when the employers come for campus placement and stuff like that. So um, one uh, unconventional thing which I did is I chose my electives very carefully. And I chose electives where uh, they provided a capstone project uh, with an organization or a firm. Now these capstone projects are not paid, they are unpaid. But what they give you is the knowledge as well as some experience that you can portray on your resume. So uh, we ended up doing a project for Adobe and we put a team of five and we were given a business problem to solve for them and we presented our results to them. They were quite impressed and did offer all the team five, all the five members hmm. a summer internship at their office. So literally like no resume was involved, no, no uh, waiting was involved. It was just proving yourself directly to uh, the employers who, who just uh, were expecting a project from you, but then you showed them your value and they in turn returned their favor by providing, the, providing you an internship. So these are some things to look for. Your capstone projects are very important and this especially and advice for people who are pursuing their degrees right now, who are in their undergraduates or a graduate degree. Try to get some, if you're looking for a data science practical experience, then this is one way of getting it. And other interesting story I would like to share is how I ended up getting my full-time job. And this was actually an unconventional route as well. So, um, Whenever we choose our first boyfriend or girlfriend, we try to, you know, date them by their looks and whether they're handsome or not. So and so that is what the first, like that was the first thing I used to see. But how do employers judge employees, right? How do they know about you? How do they know about the skills that you possess? It's your LinkedIn profile that makes a difference. Your LinkedIn profile states everything. So make sure you update your LinkedIn profile before even trying to apply for jobs. And uh, sharing my own story. So I updated my LinkedIn profile. I was about to graduate and everything. And then I came across, I started following some pages at some organizations and some people um, whom I really saw that my thoughts aligned with and some data science pioneers, uh, et cetera. And then there was this one post uh, from a manager from IBM, who is my current manager. And then she posted a role 
uh, stating the responsibilities of the role and what skill set she's looking for, et cetera, et cetera. Then I looked at the description of the role in that LinkedIn post, and I really saw myself uh, being aligned with that. Uh, I saw the skill set that uh, basically I just saw myself a great fit for that role. But how do I convey this to her? I mean, should I just send her a message? Should I just send her my resume? Will I sound desperate? All these thoughts were going on. But I just sent her a message saying that I came across this post and I really feel that, you know, I might be a good fit. When you have some time, please take a look at my profile and uh, let me know if you find me good fit or not. And I did not get a reply until 15 days. I was patient enough, didn't keep bombarding her with emails or anything. But after 15 days, I received an email saying that, okay, Sanjana, I went through your profile. It looks good. Why don't you go ahead and send me your resume? And that's how things started. And right now I'm at IBM. So this did not involve a recruiter. It directly involved a manager and an employee directly connecting on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is a powerful platform which can connect you with leaders out there uh, who are looking for you know, employees that fit the job roles that they are looking for. So make use of LinkedIn uh, as much as you can. And uh, another, um, another important uh, subject which I would like to bring up is since the time I've joined IBM, which, which has been one year, I've been working on developing curriculum in the field of data science and AI. And the research area that is happening right now in the field of AI is the trustworthy AI. So as you all know, AI plays a very important role in solving problems, which was stated clearly by Jason and Patricia. But you have to know that it is important to use uh, to construct and to use AI responsibly. So there are pillars of trust that you need to concentrate on while building AI technology or using AI technology. So um, that is like an happening um, area right now. So if you want to know more about this area, do check out the trustworthy AI research from IBM uh, on the website. And apart from that, one other thing I wanna say is often we try to be desperate in finding a job and that is common, that is human tendency. I have been desperate in finding a job. But in that process, don't try and apply to thousands of jobs out there, just trying your luck. See if that anyone will click. If I just apply to thousand, hoping that one will click. Choose your job. Don't let the job choose you. Try to build your skills and roles according to the job that you want and try to chase it rather than, you know, just trying your luck. So with that, I just want to close. Yeah. Thank you, Sanja. Um, it's, it's clear that it takes some creativity in identifying opportunities, but also it takes planning on understanding what, what it is that interests um, someone and um, using your network uh, as you did, um, your people network as well as using uh, LinkedIn and uh, also um, uh, gaining knowledge and, and experience, uh, identifying ways that you can gain knowledge and experience to be marketable. Um, Martin, could you please provide your perspectives? Um, uh, if you could focus in on uh, specifically, you know, the, master's versus PhD um, as you went through your, your process, um, is, is it worth it to have a PhD? Uh, thank you, thank you, Peru. So that's kind of like a question that once one becomes a PhD student asks repetitively throughout his <laughs> PhD, whether this is worth it <laughs> exactly. So I would say, um, I, I definitely don't, and I don't think like like uh, somebody has like a really definite answer to that question. Uh, but I would say it's more of like a subjective or individual question rather than maybe like a, a question that can be like objectively answered. So I would say uh, the the answer of that question is really individual. I think each of us, if 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 somebody. Uh, like uh, is, is trying to, to make this decision in, the, in, in their lives, I would say that they should like uh, maybe first just see whether, uh, whether they, will, they will enjoy what they will be doing throughout their PhD. So I know it sounds kind of uh, obvious, 
but but I think uh, that would be that that, that that kind of like that was my only guide when I was deciding whether to go for a master's degree or a kind of maybe spent because in my case I I had the decision of going for a master's degree or 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 because I, I, but at the same time, I couldn't like make the decision before between a master's and a PhD because I didn't have the, I wasn't prepared for a PhD. I had, maybe I had a good GPA for my undergraduate studies, but it was not enough to enroll in a PhD program. I also needed to like get, uh, gain some research skills and uh, at the same time to maybe have some some publications so that I'm, I have higher chances to be, be admitted to the PhD program. So I decided to kind of, sacrifice one or two years instead of doing a master's degree to kind of like do only research. Uh, and this was and th this was worth it for enrolling in the PhD program. But then of course, uh, um, once I was enrolled, then a, like a whole different journey started. So I would say, uh, uh, I would say like, I would ask myself like the question whether in case I enroll in a PhD program, whether this, whether I would think of it as something that uh, oh, this will last for like maybe five or six years. Uh, I, I can't wait for this to be over so that I get the benefits of, 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 of obtaining my PhD. So in that case, I would suggest maybe to take a step, like to take a break and think about whether, whether a PhD is the right choice. But if you, and if you enjoy doing research and if you, in that case, I think it would not, uh, 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 in that case, I think it would not be such a, uh, burden to maybe spend a couple of a couple of years like uh, doing research uh, research because I think those years will fly by like really fast mm -hmm. if you if you really if you really enjoy doing that of course the uh, I would just briefly say like uh, of course there are certain I would say advantages of of, of doing a PhD because afterwards uh, afterwards of course in terms of jobs and opportunities there are certain positions at which you can apply only uh, especially research positions in industry. Um, uh, because like if you, if you would categorize them in engineering and research positions, research positions especially require uh, having a PhD is kind of like a normal prerequisite for these mm -hmm. positions. So in that uh, sense, I think like PhD, doing a PhD is worth it. Or if you want to pursue, of course, an academic career. In that in that case, it's a it's a must do. Uh, but but if 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 somebody already has like a really clear idea of of their career path. And they see themselves in in industry, maybe uh, at a position oriented towards maybe development or engineering. In that case, I would definitely suggest uh, pursuing a master's degree and and uh, for, like starting your job search. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. It's it's obvious that uh, gaining the PhD um, provides additional opportunities, specifically in the area of research and um, working in academia. Um, and so it really all depends on um, what interests the individual. Um, thank you uh, to all of the panelists. Um, and again, we will have additional opportunity for um, questions uh, after the formal program ends at 4 p.m. At this point, I would like to welcome back um, co-moderator Haley Stewart to take us through the next part of the program. Thank you, Faru, and thank you all panelists um, for everything that you've shared with us. Truly um, insightful and super helpful. Um, so Abhishek, could you please reshare the slides with everyone? And you can go on, there we go. So we're delighted that the NSCC can provide free online resources for learners and educators of all ages and backgrounds. Uh, we have the Learner Central where you can learn more about um, data science fundamentals based on difficulty. So the content ranges from data science ethics all the way to programming. And then there's educators page. So for educators in high school, college, or for library programs, we've included videos, presentations, lecture notes, and code examples from IBM, UC Berkeley, MIT, and other organizations to help you build a comprehensive data science curriculum. Then there's the volunteer video library, which is pretty new. Um, it's for both learners and educators, and it houses videos on data science topics created by NSDC volunteers, including Columbia University master's students, um, who basically walk you through the content with each video and 
help to humanize the data science curriculum more. Go on to the next slide. Uh, we'd like to also officially announce our newest additions to the NSDC webpage. Um, so first we have Career Central. So that's the place where we have all the job source websites um, related to data science and data science interview resources. So um, you can go on Career Central to find latest job listings. Um, if you wanna polish your resume and cover letters and practice for technical and behavioral interviews, Career Central is to go. And we have the Volunteer Central as well. So here you'll find more information and steps to volunteering and recording a video on your own favorite data science topic and design data science use case cases, which would be a practical wing to the curriculum and enable hands-on learning for a lot of students. And finally, we have um, just built a structure for our NSDC chapter system. So each chapter um, plans to extend the mission of the NSDC in their local ways. So it's a, it's a local version of the NSDC um, and they'll be creating a community of support for chapter members um, and students and extending it through local community development initiatives. So these initiatives will, will aim to educate underserved, underrepresented learners in data science fundamentals um, and provide them with mentorship, research and career opportunities in data science. Uh, so we already have an existing chapter in Philly, in Philadelphia, um, so we'd love to expand. So if you want to learn anything about um, any of these um, new additions, uh, just go to anybigdatahub.org slash NSDC. And now I would like to pass it on to our executive director, Florence Hudson. Sure, thank you, Haley. And Abhishek, if you could go to the next slide, please. So we really wanna give a special thanks to the Northeast Student Data Core Outreach Team, which is one of the three teams that our founding committee has created, as Haley mentioned before. Uh, Faru Garamani and Jennifer Oxenford are the team leaders. And we really wanna thank Faru for being a co-moderator today. We hope Jennifer can mod co-moderate the next career panel, which will be in June. And then all of the members of the outreach team, uh, they are responsible for the data science career panels, helping identify internship and career opportunities. And as we develop the chapter system, they're actually responsible for that too. We really wanna thank everybody for their support. Next slide, please. So we will be giving certificates of appreciation to our panelists. Um, and so we really wanna make it very clear that we're very grateful for your support. We're very grateful for you being role models and sharing your time, your energy and your ideas with everybody online. We actually have received a number of questions in the Q&A, if you could be reading those, we're gonna be answering those when we're done here um, and have the extra, I love extra credit, so extra credit Q&A session. Um, but once again, Sanjana, uh, Patricia, Jason and Martin, it's really been a pleasure having you on the team. We really wanna thank you. So we'll be sending these along digitally. Next slide, please. So connect with us, you know, leverage the free NSDC resources. A number of you in the Q&A and the question and answer have been asking, where can I find resources? How can I identify what skills I need? When you go to anybigdatahub.org slash NSDC, you can page down and find Learner Central. And that's where we have curated curriculum information, data ethics classes, and the online free classes are available right through it. You just click through. Data ethics classes, beginning classes such as curated Khan Academy, pre-algebra work, um, statistics, uh, computer programming, as Haley mentioned, supervised machine learning, unsupervised machine learning, we have from getting started to intermediate to advanced. And so you can come in at the level you are, but it's also fun because you can look at the advanced stuff to see what it's going to turn into eventually, which is really fun. And like Jason was saying, you know, and Martin, see what you want to do, you know, what, what's, where's your interest area? And you can learn a lot that way. And then register, uh, you can also sign up for NSDC newsletter on the website. Everything is available at anybigdatahub.org slash NSDC. You can register for our next data science career panel on June 11th. I know a couple of people were having challenges getting into the Slack community, and I'm sorry for that. Here's a QR code. So we'll leave this up for another 30 seconds so you can take a picture of it um, on your phone, and that should bring you right to the Slack channel. You can also follow us on Twitter um, at any big data hub. And we've also just started a data core Twitter. <clears throat> and you can always email us at so the bottom right here shows NSDC at anybigdatahub.org. And we have a YouTube channel 
that has the event from February we had a data science career panel and other events that we do, including the COVID information commons and others. So now if we can go to the next slide. So now we want to go to the Q&A. And so um, it is the top of the hour, so um, we're one minute ahead of time. So we'd like to once again thank everyone who's participating today. Please uh, stay connected, join the, the, uh, the newsletter list, uh, reach out to us, join the Slack channel. I know some of you are ready for some mentoring, so reach out to me on um, the website on the Slack channel if you want. We can get you started with some mentoring. We're building up our mentoring team. So if you'd like to be a mentor, let us know as well. And so um, thank you very much to the panelists, the participants, our moderators, Haley and Faroo, um, and our entire team in the background. So now we'd like to answer the additional questions that have come in if you can stay for the extra credit session. So um, Faroo, would you wanna take us through some of the questions in there? Sure. Um, one of the questions that uh, uh, comes uh, up uh, is, um, can um, Patricia, can you provide information about, you know, what does a typical day look like for you? I was just typing all that in because it's like so. Um, so it depends on whether I, I basically separate my days into teaching days and research days. And um, and then I try to give myself uh, one day that is like, um, you know, act, like if I have service I have to do, or if I have research that I have to do, or if I have to write, which there's a lot of writing in being a professor if you're if you're doing research and teaching. Um, and so a typical day, if I have to teach, then uh, I will get up and prepare my class, make sure that everything's ready. I teach the class. And then I relax <laughs> because it's just so I usually have to put office hours on my teaching days. Um, and sometimes I try not to mix my teaching and research days, but um, like this semester, I have a larger class and few and only one TA. So then I do put some office hours on and, you know, every day I have except for Fridays. Um, and then uh, again, then Tuesdays and Thursdays. So Mondays and Wednesdays are my teaching days this week. On Tuesdays and Thursdays are my research days. So I have a lot of meetings with collaborators about the research that we're doing. Um, and then, uh, and I do that also on Fridays, but I try to do it like half days uh, because typically you also have like meetings with um, your department or committees that you're on and, uh, most people don't teach on Fridays, so that's a good day to do that kind of stuff. And that's that's a that's a typical day. Oh, and then other days I'm like planning events. Like uh, sometimes we we do workshops for students. I do a lot of events for students, so it's like workshops or hackathons. Um, just because I'm really passionate about trying to get women into computer science and into data science, I think data science is the best way to get women into computing. Um, because they they love to solve problems and they love like they're very uh, multidisciplinary like one isn't enough <laughs> um, where I see men get really deep into one but uh, women tend to be like I want to be all over the place and so data science lets you be a little bit all over the place uh, doing different things you're still deep into it but I just think that women are really first of all they like to collaborate uh, and so it's data science is great for that. So I do a lot of outreach for women in um, data science and computer science. Well, thank you. Broadening participation um, <laughs> across uh, various areas is very important. Um, uh, it's, so Jason, could you also provide um, information about, you know, how are ways that you're paving the way for others in your field um, as you're going through the work that you're doing? Is Jason there? Sorry. It sounds, it looks like Sanja. he's mute. Maybe oh. he stepped away for a minute. Thank you. Sanja, could you provide that information, please? Uh, sure, Faru. Uh, can you please repeat the question? I think Jason is back, so you might want to ask him. Oh, Jason is back? Oh, great. Um, Jason, what, do, what, what are things that you do and now in your um, the work that you're involved in to help pave the way for others in the field. Thank you, sorry, I just got called away for a moment. <laughs> I have to answer a question. Uh, yes, thank you for that question, paving the way for others. 
Um, so a lot of my work is about teaching uh, and helping other people to um, uh, be able to get the skills that they need. So there's a lot of uh, ways that I try to do that. Um, one of the things that I'm actually working, working on now is uh, improving short format training. So if you take a workshop or if you, uh, I'm sure there's actually far too many, uh, learn data science uh, in a week or whatever uh, the, the modality is. There's a lot of educational materials out there for people to uh, gain skills. And, and frankly, uh, there's desperation for it. Um, when people hope that having uh, these skills can position them for a better job or a better future, whatever they're looking for. Um, but unfortunately, as it turns out from the pedagogical point of view, um, it's actually very difficult to learn new and complex material in a short amount of time. And what, af what often happens is that people who are themselves valid experts in data science or whatever it is that they're teaching may not actually be the best teachers. And on top of that, um, it may actually be that um, when you try to say, okay, let's have a weekend workshop or an introduction to data science or things like that, um, you can actually harm people in the sense that um, these types of workshops, uh, if they're not done very well, uh, you actually turn people off to data science and off to getting started with computing because they realize, oh, wow, this is really much more complex than I thought. Um, and so you would leave people in a position that's, that's far worse uh, as far as their curiosities and their motivation is now not what it was. So one thing that I'm doing is I'm actually doing research on those areas and I'm actually holding a conference uh, later on this year on how we can bring some of those practices that we know work in educational psychology, adult education, adult learning um, accessible. I, I started a community to help with this uh, in my area, which is life sciences. So we have a site, uh, Life Side Trainers. And um, this is a group uh, mainly based on Slack, but it's all over the world of people who do short format training with the idea that we want to improve our teaching as a community of practice so that when we deliver introductory workshops or get people started in data science or whatever the topic is, that we, we, we ground it in something that is more than just uh, more than just one person's expertise, but actually pair the, pairing that expertise with the ability to teach effectively and to measure the impact and, and see that it's doing what you intended. So I'm trying to uh, help people improve their teaching uh, so that for those future um, data scientists or those people who are trying to make the transition in, into data science or just trying to gain data science skills uh, to make some of those transitions easier. So that's my answer. It's very long, but that's my answer. Thank you, Jason, for all that you're doing in this area. It's very important work. Um, Sanja, could you please provide some your perspectives on uh, the skill requirements? for data science, some, some of the foundational skill requirements? Sure, Faru. Uh, thank you for the question. So I think I'm going to share the mistake which I did initially um, when I was preparing myself for a particular job, is I did not go wrong in finding the role that I want to do. But where I went wrong is hammering myself with all the Python algorithms, the packages out there, learning every single thing that's available online and try to upskill myself in every single um, uh, modeling technique, et cetera, whatever is needed for a data scientist. Later on, I realized that it's absolutely not necessary to uh, be aware of all the technical algorithms that are available out there. What the role wants you is apart from technical expertise, which you need to a certain extent, but what you need above it all is the business understanding. How is your data science going to solve a particular business problem with like whichever company you're working for? What are they using data science for? Are they trying to use it to reduce the environmental pollution or they, are they using it to predict the predict tomorrow's weather or they, are they trying to predict the COVID curve for the next month or two months, coming months, whatever it is. Try to understand the business problem that they're trying to solve and then build your skills accordingly so that it will help you as well as your organization on how, how you go about it. 
in case you don't have a job currently and you don't know what to expect out of your future organization or an enterprise, um, try to limit yourself to particular domains. So data science is used everywhere in every single domain. There is no domain that doesn't use data science, but try to build your expertise by limiting yourself to one domain or an, an or an industry, I would say. So for example, I started off concentrating my energy, like building up all my energy in data science towards the field of education. How, uh, what are the trends that uh, people like to learn in artificial intelligence? What is the most happening topic and how do we present it so that people can learn it in shorter time, uh, et cetera. So suppose, uh, see for Jason, he is an expert in biotech. For example, um, just try to limit yourself to uh, an industry or a domain and try to build your expertise in a small, narrow um, problem rather than, you know, being a generalist in data science because it's huge. It's an ocean. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you, Sanja. Um, Martin, could you provide some, uh, some uh, insights with regard to uh, the difference between computer science and data science. Oh, I see. Um, thank you, Pro. So, computer science is kind of like a, a like a more general field. I would say data uh, uh, in computer in computer science is more uh, is kind of uh, I would say like. This is not a formal definition, but uh, it's related to to essentially like it's it's related to to the it's a, the science of computing of the manners in which we 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 we, we compute like or, or make certain like uh, computing uh, uh, operations. So it it's it's I think it's an um, uh, so on the other side, data science is not data science is not necessarily a subfield of computer science. I think a part of it, a part of data science, uh, kind of st is stemming from from computer from com computer science in the sense that computer science is still like related to like there are parts of computer science which are related to um, I would say or are intersecting with uh, probability and statistics, and in that sense, I think. So, Statistics also contributed to some parts of, of, of data science. So I, I would say there are certain subfields in computer science from which from which uh, from which da data science stemmed or originated. However, data science nowadays is so interdisciplinary. I would say that we cannot attribute like uh, the creation of data science only to computer science. I think it's some aspects of it, as I said, as I said, originated from, from computer science, but I think it's, a, it's an intersection of multiple fields. So I would say it's an intersection of maybe uh, statistics, mathematics, in particular statistics and computer science, but it has applications in, in, in many various fields, like it can, have, it can have applications like in, in domains such as like uh, biomedicine, healthcare, up to domains such as weather forecasting or, or even like, uh, or it can even help like make more informative uh, uh, business uh, uh, decisions as, as uh, Sanjana uh, suggested. So I would say it's an intersection of multiple fields. One of them is, is computer science. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I, I have a question that um, it applies to everyone here is, um, what would you recommend for um, someone who, who is just um, in, in another area, has no experience in data science in uh, starting out in the area of data science? Um, we talked about gaining knowledge and experience, what specific areas do you recommend? What are some specific tools that, that or uh, technologies that um, uh, those individuals should get exposed to? So I, I might have a comment. Um, let me keep it brief. I think because Patricia was unmuting. I don't know if you're about to answer this one too, so I don't want to step over you, but- Okay, no, no, um, okay. <laughs> maybe I would just sort of say, uh, even if you have no expertise in data science, you have expertise likely in something. Uh, so really trying to figure out where you are at and then what's the next rung on the ladder and not necessarily jumping to a ladder that's not really meant for you. Um, because you're going to need to, to be able to uh, direct your curiosity towards um, a, a structure that's gonna really be 
uh, goal directed versus I'm just curious about the world. I think this is something we heard from uh, Sanjana earlier. Um, it could really be disastrous uh, because there's it, it's it's like it's a whole bunch of noise out there. Everything seems important. Everything seems the latest thing to learn. This is the hottest skill, and you won't have any way to um, to make sense of it. So thinking about what might be the closest area uh, to something you're already doing, and then probably the second piece of advice would be to really now find a mentor, a colleague, a friend, a teacher who can give you advice because it starts to become that there's just too much noise to find the signal. And so you need someone who can help you interpret and, and make decisions about what's important to pay attention to and when not, what may not be important. I think that's the best advice I could give because anything else like learn R, learn Python, I mean, maybe that might be the right answer. It could be all com completely wrong. So you're gonna need help more than we can give you here, but find that mentor and find something that's close to something that you already do feel you know. Thank you, Jason. And Patricia, did you have yeah. that? Well, I honestly, you know, back in the day when I was studying, we didn't have YouTube. We didn't have, like, you guys have YouTube. You guys, like, take advantage of that. Um, there's a stat quest is a really, really great. Um, and I, I turn, like, we don't have courses in AI. We don't have, so a lot of my students have to actually self-learn. And the sooner you learn to teach yourself or the sooner you find the passion that will drive you to do it, Honestly, what made me come back was just looking at videos, uh, you know, of what people were doing. I was interested in medicine and technology, so I do look for videos in medicine and technology. Um, then I was interested in in in, um, in basically what, what re my father is a you know my grandfather was a cardiologist, my dad was a doctor, so I always had this medical part with me. And one of the things that I started looking at, okay, what are they doing to analyze like vital signs? And so I started looking at that and that became time series. And in the end, my dissertation was multivariate time series analysis of physiological and clinical data. It all started with like, my dad did something. I don't like blood. <laughs> I basically like technology. So I started looking about what they were doing with technology. They were doing amazing things with CT scans, um, making back in the day, making them 3D. That was so new. And when I started seeing that kind of stuff, it made me passionate. And then once I got that passion, then I wanted to learn how to code. And then you can, now we didn't have things to teach you how to code now. There's so many free resources. There's data camp. There's, um, like I said, StatQuest. Data camp, if you want to go like the Python route, R route, but the more like data analyst. And, and StatsQuest is just to help you with the complex idea. There's Khan Academy that really breaks, I mean, they're experts that really, um, teach you and they want to teach you they're trying to democratize uh you know st statistics and computing um there's data carpentries um where they offer like you can actually look there and they'll do they do a class for one week uh, teaching you how to do github which is really important uh technology wise if you're going to be a data scientist so you you know how to store your information um and so they'll teach you github as well as uh and and you know just these how to run the command line um and so there's there's so many resources so it, it just start doing them on your free time spend a night at home instead of going to the movies spend a night geeking out on youtube <laughs> like, there thank you patricia thank you for, i'll list uh, some of those in the comments I'll, I'll put the ones that i like the best in the comments thanks so much for raising awareness to the various technologies to um, to learn and, and get more information about. Um, at this Before time, if I you want to say thank something? Is that okay? Sure. I'm thank sorry. you. And so please go to the NSTC webpage as well. Patricia, thank you for adding all that. Maybe we can add what you put into the, into the chat, you know, onto the NSD website, because in Learner Central, we have a whole bunch of curated curriculum. We have some Khan Academy basics, you know, in getting started, pre-algebra and things like that. Um, we actually have videos that one of the data science um, students at Columbia recorded, which presents the supervised machine learning, IBM Open Data Science for All material um, that's on GitHub and PowerPoint. Now he can makes it come to life. He presents how to do Jupyter Notebooks, um, you know, related to data science. So please use Learner Central. And Patricia, we love that you're going to add more material mm -hmm. for us. Go ahead, Flo. Thank you, Florence. 
And um, again, we want to thank the panelists uh, for spending additional time with us. Um, we thank all of the participants uh, who engaged in the discussion uh, through Q&A, and we look forward to seeing all of you at the next career panel webinar and engaging with us in the Slack channel. Absolutely. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Be well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Can you give me a minute to type one of them? Um... To type. Oh, yeah, I'm not going anywhere. Okay, but... okay. <laughs> Learning on YouTube. I'll just put it, I'm answering, um, there was one like, what would you guys say is the most popular or used program? Should I put it there? Oh, sure. Yeah, you can type, uh, okay. just type answer. I'll just put like um, Khan Academy. Well, just like learning environments in terms of learning environments. Uh, That's great. And while you're typing that, um, there's a suggestion of having hands-on sessions for Jupyter Notebooks for data science, which is a great idea because we have these data science career panels <clears throat> every other month. And we're thinking of having like a real um, use case or a teach data science or hands-on Jupyter Notebook type thing on the other months. So maybe we can get someone to teach that. That would be great. Uh, hold on. I said Data Camp, Khan Academy. What were the other ones I mentioned? Uh, Data um, oh, data carpentries, yes. Data carpentries is really good. I think those are the big ones. Data Camp, Khan Academy. Khan Academy has data science stuff. Uh, and I'll just put YouTube. Oh, Star, no, Star, the Star. Oh, what was it called? I just said Stats Quest. Stats mm -hmm. Quest, which is like for people who want more of the math stuff. Okay, Stats Quest. Those are the big ones that I use for my students. So I'll put that there. It is wonderful. All right, guys. Thank, Thank you so you. much. It's been a pleasure. Oh, Thank you so much, Patricia. We really appreciate it and everybody. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Be well. Bye-bye. You too. Okay, excellent. I think we're all done. So um, I think uh, there are still 48, 47 people on. Very good at extra credit. For the people who are still there, we could do like a little run through the website maybe and show them Learner Central since we didn't uh, do a live demo. Um, so why not? So I'll just share my screen for the 45 people who are getting extra credit on a Friday afternoon, which I'm always impressed with. So when you go to the NSDC website, anybigdatahub.org slash NSDC, you can go down here um, to the data science uh, resources for learners and educators. Here, if you click on Learner Central, you can see some of the material that we were talking about, which has been curated by our content and pedagogy team. You can see there are data science ethics classes, uh, including videos. There's an edX class at the university, from the University of Michigan on data science ethics. There's a link to the IBM Open Data Science for All Ethics, um, as well as the Data Responsibly series, which is a comic book series, um, an intellectual comic book series that actually is available in French, Spanish, and English. Um, you can also look at the, um, that's a, the overall data science ethics, which everybody should care about because ethics is very critical in data science. Then in the getting started area, as Patricia was talking about Khan Academy as an example, you can look here at some of the Khan, Khan Academy modules we suggest in arithmetic and pre-algebra, algebra and introduction to data. And you can see there are some videos here as well and analyzing categorical data, a full data science course for beginners by free code camp. I think Patricia was talking about code camp. So there's a lot of free online material that you can use um, anytime. Either if you're quarantined or not, if it's raining or snowing, it's snowing in New Hampshire today. Um, and then there's an introductory to intermediate area as well as an intermediate to advanced area. So you can come in at the level that you want to. You can look ahead to see what else you'll be learning. As an example, here's linear algebra, vectors, matrices, linear, um, and in calculus, we have derivatives, applications of derivatives, regression analysis, as well as visual analytics, machine learning. 
And here we actually have um, slides from the different um, classes. And then we have a video series on supervised machine learning that was created by a data science student at Columbia University. And you could review any of these online. Um, so here's supervised machine learning uh, with this Columbia data with a Tomislav Galyanik. And he also has some Jupyter notebook uh, materials as well. So there's a lot that you can find and we really encourage you to use it, share it with your friends. And then if you want to contact us at um, any, NSDC at anybigdatahub.org, we'll be looking for what people would really like to see in a live class um, and maybe in some recorded classes. Um, so there's an opportunity for you to continue to communicate with us. Let us know what you need. Um, you can even look at computer science and programming and learn about Python and R. Um, look at the differences between Python and R for data analytics by DataCamp, and then go deeper into Python and R and computer tools, including the missing semester from MIT. So there's a lot of material at your fingerprints, uh, fingertips, and we really hope you're able to take advantage of it. And tell us what else would be um, more valuable for you, because this is really for all of you. Um, and that's why it's here. So that's it. Um, thank you very much, everyone, and for those who stayed. And Faru and Haley, great job. And uh, Helen and everyone else in the background, and Macy and Abhishek. Everyone have a nice evening and a great weekend. You too. Thank you.